Acts chapter 6, we're in the first seven verses there, and the title of today's message is, The Word Must Be First. The Word Must Be First. How many of you have heard the phrase, uh, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing? Anybody heard that phrase before? Only a few of you? Like seriously, like like. 10 of you? Anybody heard that? The main thing is, man, we may have to do like a little uh, origin of that phrase. Uh, I thought most people knew this, but the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. It's a great leadership principle, a great management principle. I have many books on my shelf uh, on leadership and management, and and I can't tell you the amount of times that it's referenced and talked about in different ways in different fashions, but it's important. It's a great principle of leadership. I've found it to be uh, very wise and very helpful in many different areas. I mean, it Can you just imagine what would happen if the main thing wasn't the main thing and wasn't kept as the main thing? Things would get crazy. I mean, what if uh, if McDonald's started selling cars, right? Can you just imagine what designs McDonald's would be coming out with? I mean, the cars would look like hamburgers and french fries, or my son would probably want one that's shaped like a chicken nugget. You know, he loves chicken nuggets, right? McDonald's making cars. All in favor? No. Keep the main thing the main thing. Make good burgers, right? Some of you are like, maybe they should start making good burgers. No, 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 wait. I saw you at McDonald's last week. Come on. Main thing to keep, or or, or how about this? What if if LeBron James, with all his amazing basketball talent, one of of the greatest, not the greatest, but one of the greatest basketball players of all time, what if he went and worked at McDonald's? So you pull up, you're like, hey, I'd like a uh, Coke Zero, please. Yeah, I'll pull around. And then all of a sudden, you're at the drive-thru. LeBron James is like, what's up? I'll be a buck 07, please. You're like, LeBron James, it's great to see you. What are you doing here? I'm changing careers. You'd be like, what? Dude, you got a main thing in your life, obviously, clearly. Nobody can play basketball like you, except Michael Jordan. You need to keep the main thing the main thing, right? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And uh, this principle of wisdom applies to the church pretty well, actually. Uh, In fact, as we look in God's word this morning, we see the primacy of God's word being focused on. And as the God's church and God's people and God's leaders, we have to be focused on the main things that God is focused on. And one of the supreme ones, in fact, the, the first thing that we ought to be focused on as God's church is the proclamation of God's word. The the going forth and the spreading of the gospel and the teaching of the exhaustive uh, gospel as pronounced through all of God's words and all of God's scripture. And so we need to keep what God keeps primary and best, we need to keep that primary and best and first as well. And so we're going to see actually that from the Bible and, uh, and, and see that example in the early church. So if you have your copy of God's word, let's turn there right now, Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1, and follow along as I read. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of wisdom, or excuse me, full of the spirit and uh, full of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now the point here that, uh, that runs throughout God's word and, and this passage this morning is this. Write this down in your notes. Point number one, God's word must be the church's first priority. God's word must be the church's first priority. 
Uh, it, it, we see throughout all of Scripture, we see from, uh, from the time when Jesus came to the apostles, uh, to the apostle Paul, and out, throughout Scripture, and, or excuse me, throughout church history, that the primacy of God's Word has been so vital and important. The apostles knew it was so important, in fact, that they're going to withhold themselves from, from participating in an important ministry to help in the midst of a conflict in this passage. But we also see in other parts of Scripture the importance uh, told about and spoken about. When the apostle Paul spoke to Timothy, a young pastor, and was telling him, hey, Timothy, you've got to focus on some things as you're a pastor, as you're leading the church and growing that church in Ephesus, he gave him a few words and encouragements. One was from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, when he said, Until I come, devote yourselves, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. And then it was so important that he revisited that subject again in his second letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 13 and 14, he says, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Timothy, guard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guard the scriptures and the sound teaching of God's word. Guard these things according uh, to, uh, to sound teaching. And then he says later in uh, 2 Timothy, affirms this again and just talks about the importance of Scripture. In verse 16 of chapter 3, he says, All Scripture is breathed out by God, an inspiration of God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Timothy, you want to equip your people for working for the sake of the cause of Jesus Christ? Man, give them the word. The word of God is essential. So much so, he goes in on in chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And if it wasn't enough for the apostles, if it wasn't enough for Paul, guess what? The reformers also uh, knew that it was so important that many of the reformers throughout church history would give their lives for a tenet called sola scriptura, not basing our faith on traditions and, and the, the musings of men, but rather basing it on the inspired, God-breathed word of God. And if it, wasn't, uh, if it wasn't enough there, we also see it from a uh, quote from Martin Luther. I don't know if we would totally agree with this, but, um, but you could see Luther's heart and, uh, for the word of God and how esteemed he had. He said that the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. I mean, think of the gravity of that to say, man, when, when a preacher stands up and has rightly exegeted God's word and declares that unto the people, that is the word of God. I don't know if I fully uh, agree with everything in that, but for the parts that are true and in keeping with God's word, amen and amen. And the reality that we can see and know and trust is that God's word must be the church's first priority. And in this passage in Acts chapter 6, guess what? We see a conflict arising. Why is the conflict arising? And we're not totally sure exactly, but there's a growth issue. <laughs> They're growing like crazy. So fast, in fact, that, it, that, that they can't even keep up. And you look back in, in verse 1, it says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the church is growing. It's increasing in number. People are coming to faith. And that's a really great thing, in fact, because the gospel and God's word is going forth. But a problem arises, and that conflict, it, it, it develops a dissension amidst the church and a disunity, and that dissension and disunity threatens the very health and fabric of the church and their witness before the world. And so we need to be essentially keeping God's word as the first priority of the church. Now, how do we do that? We can see the example and learn some principles here from God's word as we, uh, as we continue. Uh, the first, uh, first way we can keep God's word first priority is to address conflicts immediately. 
address conflicts immediately. So this conflict arises, and what do the, what do the 12 apostles do, right? The church is just growing, it's taken off, things are going on a great path, and, and they're seeing some amazing things, amazing works of God. A conflict arises, and what do they do? They bury their heads in the sand. Did you see that in the text? Anybody see that in the text? Well, maybe it was in the Greek, right? No, 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 it's not in the Greek. They didn't. They went right after it. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So there's a conflict that's come, a conflict that's arisen between the Hellenists, these were Greek-speaking Christians, or, or Jews, Greek-speaking Jews who had become believers in Christ, and those who were Hebrew-speaking Jews, those who, uh, uh, or, or who, the Hebrews, they actually spoke Aramaic uh, back in those days. And so you have almost a culture clash going on in the early church between these two groups, because the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. This, you know, in Thanksgiving when we're taking a benevolence offering, uh, they would take offerings in the same fashion and they would distribute those funds to those who had need. And all of a sudden they're growing and the, and the, the, the money's not di- being divided, the food's not being divided in a way, that is, uh, the, a way that is fair, a way that is meeting all the needs. And so there, there arises this conflict and the 12 address it. Immediately, without delay, they go after it. And they assign uh, some, uh, some tasks to address the conflict. Now, we don't know what, what exactly was the root of that conflict. Was it relational in, ma- in, in nature? It could have been prejudice going on in the church. Maybe they were like, well, there's only a little bit of funds, or, or, or we, don't know, we don't know if we want to give it to you. It could have been relational. It could have been functional in the fact that it was growing so fast. They're like, wait a minute, how do we handle all this? And I don't know, should we, we'll give it to them, and we'll give it to them, and they give it to their families first. I, we don't know exactly what's going on. But it's enough of a concern that there's a conflict arising in the church. Now, do conflicts ever arise in the church? Only in the church. No, I mean, not at Grace, but at, at, at other churches, right? <laughs> All God's people said, <clears throat> no. Yes, we've got conflicts too, and they arise, and they come up. No church is perfect, and, uh, and, and the only time... Uh, you know, I wonder sometimes if there'll be, there'll be some conflicts that happen in heaven. It won't be huge conflicts because it'll be like, well, why don't we just go ask Jesus? Okay. <laughs> you know, so like probably won't be any conflicts because it'll be easily resolved in many respects. But they address the conflict here immediately. You ever been to a church that didn't address conflict? You ever been to that church? I've been to that church. What happens in that church? Gossip slander right insecurity maneuvering politicking behind the, all that kind of garbage oh right and you're just like oh man i can remember early on when we uh, when we planted one of the things that was impressed on me is resolve conflict resolve conflict and go after it don't let it linger don't let it go don't don't run away from it but deal with it and I, I purposed in my heart to say, God, give me wisdom as we do it. And I've had to grow a lot in that area. But by God's grace, we've addressed conflicts. And for the most part, we enjoy the blessing of that. Our elders are for that. Our deacons are for that. And we go after that as much as we can to address it immediately when it comes about. I would tell you, as God's, uh, as God's leaders, for those of you who are elders, for those of you who are deacons, for those of you who are staff, for those of you who are pastors... In our church, address conflict immediately. When you see it, go after it. Try and get in and go, what's at the root, all right? Now, that doesn't always mean that, there, that we have to like bring a, a, a hard hammer every time, but it does mean that we go, hey, there's conflict, and we need to be diligent to preserve the spirit of unity that we have in this church. So let's try and get a biblical and a godly and a humble resolution to this conflict as quickly as possible. And you can participate with us in that as a church family as well. When you see conflicts, this isn't something just for the leaders, though the apostles took it. We can all do this to go after, uh, go after conflict immediately. Uh, now, you may be saying, like, why would we do that? 
Why should we address conflict immediately? I kind of like it when we don't. I like avoiding it or, 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 or I, like, I like just not even thinking about it, like kind of sweeping it under the rug. That makes it easier, right? Loved ones, here's what happens. If the apostles did not address this matter and this conflict continued, can I tell you what would have happened? It would have consumed the early church. It would have divided the early church. It may have destroyed their witness in front of Jerusalem and the word of God would have been hindered. The gospel may have been halted in that area because they're like, I'm not going to deal with any of the, and head in the sand, not, let's, let's give ourselves to resolving conflict biblically, humbly, and immediately, as quickly as we can. Address conflicts immediately. You say, how do I do that? Man, Matthew 18 is a great place. Number one, go to God. Go to God. And pray about it. If you're hurt, if you've got something that somebody sinned against you, go and pray about it first. All right? Wrestle that before the Lord. If after you go to God, then go to the person, right? And try and deal with it directly in truth and grace and love. But deal with it directly. Don't wait. Don't figure it, you know, that somebody else is going to figure it out or they're going to know eventually because I'm really distant. I'll just deal with it. Go directly to them and address it. Just go, hey, we've got something between us. And, and you may not even know it, but can we talk? Do you mind if we just sit down sometime this week or when it's convenient and just kind of work this thing out? Maybe hear each other and get to a better understanding. Direct confrontation in that way that is gracious and yet truthful it, it helps and protects the church and our witness and allows God's word to be uh, first priority and not take the focus on something else. So to keep it first, we have to address conflicts immediately. Go after that in your life. Here's another, another point. Uh, they delegate lesser duties. Delegate lesser duties. We see the apostles do this as well. Look in verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve table, tables. And they, they say, pick out some men to handle this, this, uh, this task. Verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The word of God, loved ones, has primacy in the church. We spoke about that already. And the apostles were committed to that. Uh, do you know what that's, who that's been passed on to, that commitment to focus and, and to pr protect and to lead and to guide the church in their ministry of the word? Who has God given to the church for that role today? The elders. The elders of the church have been granted that role. And so they would, they would fit that description in some sense that the primary role of the elders is the spiritual leadership. That's why we focus on doctrine and discipleship and direction at the church. Those are ministries of the word and prayer. And the primacy of God's word must be central. And for them, they're like, hey, we do not want to focus on serving tables. Now that sounds a little odd, right? Does it sound like they might be a little selfish? Self-serving? Well, you don't want the grunt work. You just want to go into your study and be able to look and mine all the truths of God's word and love God's word while everybody else is sweating for the kingdom. What kind of leaders are you, huh? Is that lame? That's not what's going on at all. Can I encourage you? There's nothing of selfishness here. What they are thinking is about the love of God and the love of God's people and what is best for the church. And literally what they are saying here is it would not be right for us to focus on serving a physical need, whether it's giving money for the sake of uh, benevolence or whether so you can buy food and take care of your necessities or actually providing food and serving those tables. Rather, rather than serving you physical food, we're going to focus on serving you spiritually spiritual food because we know what is eternal we know what is is best because God has called us to this very thing and so for the leaders in God's church uh, the primary role is God's word God's word is first and everything else is lesser than that right that's not to say that everything else is not important but that's to say that it is of less importance than the word 
And so to be a church that is a biblical church, to be a church that is focused on the things that God is focused on, our first calling must be, how do we get God's word to other people? How do we continue to encourage them? How do we support the preaching of God's word? How do we support the... the, The word of God going into the hearts of our children. Can I tell you, even in our student ministries, our fuel fuel student ministries for junior high and high school, it would be great to have a ton of games. It would be great to have great music. It would be great to have goofy leaders and, and doing really crazy things. But at the same time, can I tell you what's greater than all of that for students? Man, that our leaders give them the word of God. That they hear God's truth. Now, do we package it in a way that students will hear? Yes, we try very hard at that. But I would tell you that, that the greatest thing we can give them, the greatest thing you can give to your children is the word of God. And the greatest thing that we can give to the world as God's people is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the expression of that throughout all of scriptures. So we need to delegate lesser duties. They also delegated it in an interesting way when they say, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute. That's an interesting way that they were handling this situation. They were like, the word of God is so important. We're not even going to go look for the, for the godly pers- people. We're going to put together a search committee. And the search committee within the church is going to go and find some people who would be good examples and would meet the criteria that we're going to lay forth. And so they delegated even that responsibility so they could focus on the word of God. We did this uh, when we were searching for you, Aaron. You know, we went and we put together a search committee, people of the worship ministry, people uh, who were faithful servants, people who were knowledgeable, and, uh, and we put them together. And you probably remember being interviewed by, uh, by a few of them sitting around. We had you and Rachel uh, over, in the, over in the offices and uh, doing lunch together and everybody peppering you with questions and giving you the hardest ones we possibly could, right? <laughs> And you passed, so welcome. You can stay. <laughs> and we actually put together a search committee. And when they were done, they gave, the, they gave the recommendation to the elder board. And it was easy for the elder board at that point because they were like, wow, what a great choice. Done, right? What a great thing. But delegating lesser responsibilities or lesser duties within the church is important if we're going to keep the word of God a primary I love management principles. I, uh, I focus on them a lot. It's, uh, it's good to have good, uh, good management principles in, uh, in areas of leadership. I can remember, I, out of all the books I've read, I don't know which one it came from, like Good to Great or, uh, or uh, One Minute Manager or something like that, but I remember one of them, uh, one of them talked about how you respond to to-do list items. Anything that comes to you, like what do you do with that? Like how do you handle those things? And I remember uh, somebody talking about ordering your life and one of the things he said is everything that comes to you, make a decision in five minutes. Or, 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 or you make a decision as to whether you can do it in five minutes or not, right? And that decision is can I do this very thing, get this thing done in five minutes? If I can, I'm gonna do it now. If not, it goes into a pile. And there's three piles on my desk. I actually have three sections of my desk. So if you came in, you'd see things all across everyone's. Usually it's pretty messy at some points. But but I'm telling you, like, there is the desk that is for today. Then there is the desk that is for this week. And there is the desk for that is this month or, or longer. And I'm telling you, it has been so helpful. Just like five minutes. Can I do this now? Get it done. If not, management's principles, they're great. One of them was also, somebody said early on in ministry, they said, hey, your role as a pastor is not to do everything in the church, right? Definitely to serve, definitely to be an example through your service, but at the same time, your role in the church, primary is equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so you have to ask yourself as well, when something comes across your desk, is this something the Lord wants me to do? Or is this something the Lord wants me to equip the saints to do? That was hugely helpful. And it goes back to this principle of delegating things of lesser duties. Delegating those things. And maybe you would just apply those in your own life. Think about the things that you prioritize. In in the ways in which you focus your, your life around. Can I tell you there is no greater priority in your own life than God's word. Right? Getting God's word into your life, getting it into your family's life, and loving it and treasuring it and living according to it. And in the church is no different. We need to keep God's word as first and primary of first priority. 
Three things, address conflicts immediately, delegate lesser duties. Here's, here's the last one, install godly leadership. Install godly leadership. So that's what they do. Verse three, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and those other five. Now, the reason I want to focus on Stephen and Philip just for a second there is because Luke introduces people into the story who later on are going to be very important to the cause of the gospel and of Jesus Christ. And so uh, Stephen is going to, we're going to be talking about him very shortly, and Philip's going to come very soon as well. So these disciples, or, or these uh, men who are uh, committed to these things uh, are, are go beyond just serving tables as well. They are very instrumental in the, uh, in the focus uh, ministry of God's, uh, God's gospel. So install godly leadership. And what we see here, I believe, and, uh, and, and many uh, scholars would say that uh, what is happening here is the installation of the first deacons in the church. You know, the office of deacons, we've got two offices here, uh, the offices of, office of elders and the office of deacons. Uh, those are the main offices of the church. And, uh, and, and God instituted those, and uh, you see that in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, in Titus chapter 1, and uh, here is one of the main uh, passages that people would look at and go back to to say, hey, here were some of the first uh, deacons of the church. And what are the qualifications that we see? Of being given for these people. What is good leadership? What is godly leadership in the church and for God's people look like? Well, here's what they said. Verse three. First, it's, they said seven men. All right, seven men. Now, we can debate whether or not deacon, the role of deacon is just for women or if it's just for men. Um, the, the elders are actually doing a, a biblical study about that reality uh, due to uh, some other passages in 1 Timothy 3 specifically, also Romans chapter 16. We're wrestling through that very issue ourselves. But what I'll say here is it is specifically and clearly in the Greek, it is speaking about seven men. Now, why would they do that to address this conflict? I think that might have been done because um, uh, one scholar said this. I thought this was uh, very helpful and very pertinent. He said that it was probably done uh, because seven men is a tradition in Jewish communities uh, that was set up where seven respected men actually managed the public business in an official council. And so uh, in the business matters and in, in, in the Jewish community, they would actually set up seven men, seven males to handle those things in that culture. And so I'm, sh I'm thinking they probably are bringing in some of that tradition, some of that Hebrew tradition, so to speak, to bear on this conflict. But what's interesting also then is they bring in seven specific men. And if you go through these names, Stephen, Philip, a Prochorus and, and Nicanor and Timon and, and Parmenas and Nicholas. For all of these names, these are Hellenistic believers. These are Greek-speaking names. These are Greek-speaking Christians. And Nicholas himself isn't even a Jew. He's a Gentile, right? And so this man is a proselyte. He was a convert to Judaism and then became a convert to Christianity. And so when the church is seeing the, the unifying element of the way in which this conflict is being resolved, man, they rejoice. They're like, how great, what a great way to do it. And so they chose seven men, male leadership they started with. Whether that continues for deacons today is, uh, is definitely a question uh, to, be, uh, to be wrestled down. The other qualifications are clear. Full of the Spirit, right? Remember we talked about the fullness of the Spirit. What does that look like as a godly leader? That looks like somebody whose heart is surrendered to the Spirit of God. They are giving themselves over to the control of God's Spirit in their lives. And they are manifesting the fruits of the Spirit as a result. And they are, you're seeing godly principles flow through their lives and godly character come out of their lives as they surrender their lives. They're surrendered to the Spirit of God. But they're also uh, full of, uh, or they have good repute as well. Good repute. 
And this is the idea you see over in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus chapter 1, where it says they should be above reproach, right? They should be people who you look at their lives, and are they perfect? What do you think, church? Do you think they're perfect? No, no, they're not perfect. The only perfect person was Jesus Christ. But the tenor of their life is lived in victory. The tenor of their life is lived in a place where they, uh, they are living in a, a place of blamelessness before God and before man. They are not living in outright rebellion before the Lord. Their life is an example. They are respected among the community. They are respected among God's people. And their lives are, uh, are continually uh, growing in victory over sin and living in godly character. Men of good repute, men full of the spirit, but also men full of wisdom. Wisdom was the, was the last one mentioned. And wisdom is the ability, the ability to discern, the ability to discern right from wrong, good from bad, and wise from foolish. It's the practical application of God's truths that, that leads to this understanding of what is foolish and what is wise, what is, uh, what is bad and what is good, what is wrong and what is right. And it's this wisdom that, uh, that you should see. Sometimes you can find godly, godly men, but they're not wise men at the same time. They love the things of the Lord. They may even know a lot about God's word, but they're not necessarily wise. They don't have good discernment. They don't look and address situations in a great way all the time. And so it's important to get godly leadership full of the spirit, good repute, and wise. I would, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite pastors uh, of church history is uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I remember reading uh, a couple biographies uh, about him, and uh, in one of them, they noted that on his, on his church staff and, and in the inner workings of the leadership of his churches, that, uh, or the church that he was at, Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle, um, they noted that his leadership was so uh, godly and his leadership was so wise that, uh, that they said his, uh, his church staff was remarkably conflict low. Not conflict free because conflicts will come, but it was, there, was, there wasn't as many of them, right? And when there were, they were dealt with and they were handled and they weren't a thing. Like the church wasn't dealing with it all the time going, what drama is going on behind the scenes now, right? You ever felt like that sometimes when you go to church? You're like, oh my goodness, can't you just get along, right? And at, and at Charles Haddon Spurgeon's church, it was remarkably low, remarkably few, because it was godly leadership. They noted that about him. And, and I'll tell you, I'm thankful for godly leadership here at Grace. I'm thankful for the godly leadership that has been put in place that God has brought to this church through the elders and the deacons and the staff and their heart for the Lord. Because I can tell you throughout the almost 10 years of our church's existence, can I tell you that when we've had good leadership, man, we have been blessed. And the church has seen good health and it has been helped in a good ways. But when leadership has been bad, it has hurt the church significantly. And while, while everything does not rise and fall on the leadership, I will tell you that one of the ways to prioritize God's word and keep God's word central is to have good, godly leaders around the table. God's word must be the church's first priority. And we can protect that by addressing conflicts, delegating duties that are less important, and installing godly leadership. Let me, let me give you the last point here this morning. It's from verse 7. I want to read that first. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. How awesome is that? That when they focused on that conflict and got that thing resolved, when they were delegating the lesser important duties that needed to be happen, happen happening in the church, when they left those things to a good godly leadership, growth happened. And that's the last point I want to leave you this morning. When God's word is the church's first priority, growth happens. 
And in this passage, we see that the gospel was going forth. The scriptures and the teaching of God's word, Christianity was breaking forth like wildfire in the early church because they were committed to the word of God. What a powerful thing. Now, I want to close our service here. I want to close even uh, this message by just asking you a couple things. And, and why don't we take a moment, let's just bow our heads so we can, I can ask you personally before the Lord and we can wrestle these things down. So why don't you just bow your head right now and let me ask you these things before the Lord. Number one, do you love what God loves? And do you treasure what God treasures? In your heart, what are those things that are of first importance? Maybe when you're thinking about how to build your family. Or maybe when you're thinking about how to build your workplace and your career. Or maybe when you're thinking about what kind of church to choose. Or what kind of church to contribute to. And to serve at. And to give your life for the cause of Jesus Christ with you love the things that God loves? Because if you do, God loves his word. And his word is primary because it is so precious. It is eternal. It is everlasting. It is powerful. It fulfills the purpose for which God intends every single time. Is that primary in your heart? When you think of God's church, do you think, man, it has to be a church that loves the word. Here's a number two question. Do you want this church to be a great church? Do you want your church family to be a great church family? If your answer is yes, it has to be a church where God's word is first. If we want to be a church that God looks at and says, hey, I'm so proud of you. Hey, I want to bless you. We have to prioritize God's ways and God's word here. Do you want that? Now ask yourself, do I want that actively, that I'm willing to do what is necessary? Maybe there's a conflict that needs to be addressed that's going on in your heart between you and another person at this church. Would you take a step of faith and seek to resolve it? Would you make a, make a determination today to say, God, I'm not going to put my head in the sand. I'm not going to avoid it. I'm not going to attack the person about it. I'm not going to uh, give some excuse or some reason why I shouldn't deal with this. I'm going to speak the truth in love, and I'm just going to go and, and, and try to have a good conversation with this person about it. The word must be first. And then lastly, here's a question for you. How can you further and foster the priority of God's word at this church? And through this church, and through your life and your service at this church, how can you help God's word go for, forth? Maybe that's stepping out and sharing the gospel with a friend that you have. Somebody that the Spirit has been saying, hey, just go build a relationship so that they can hear about the goodness of God's Word. Or maybe, maybe for you, that may be uh, finding a way to support the teaching. You're, say, you, you're one of those people who's like, I, I'm a behind-the-scenes kind of person. How can you then, with your gift, support the going forth of God's Word? Or maybe God would even give and lay upon some of our hearts here a way uh, that we could extend the reach of God's word. Maybe some of you, the Lord is calling to, to missions work. Maybe the Lord's calling you to uh, take some of the messages or take some of the teachings and to go share them with other people. How can you further that? God's word must be first in the church. 
Father, we thank you today that Grace Community is a church that is seeking to be about these things. Thank you that your word is primary, that the way in which we do relationships, we look to your word. The way in which we approach our finances, we try to look to your word. The way in which we focus our ministry and design our ministry based on your word. Lord, the way in which we seek leadership in your church, God, based on your word. Thank you for a church that is about that. Thank you for the elders and for the deacons and for the pastors and the staff that you have assembled here. Thank you for the lay leaders who give themselves, the small group leaders who pour themselves out week after week for the sake of just helping people wrestle down God's word in a small group context. Lord, I pray that, Father, you would continue to encourage them, continue to affirm the gifting that they have for that. And I pray that you would further implant the words deep within our hearts. Father, for those who get the word to our children every Sunday, who give of their time and their efforts so that our children would be raised according to the words, so, uh, to your word, so that, Father, they would understand the gospel, that they might choose it for themselves, that they would understand the teachings of your word. God, would that continue to grow and continue to increase here? I pray for many hearts around here who would uh, speak new words uh, from your word, Lord, words that are children have not heard before from your word that they would know them and hear them and know all of your ways and the full counsel of God's word as they grow. I pray, Father, over this church that you would raise up children's workers for that call and that cause. I pray that, Father, you would continue to give us a hunger and a passion for more of your word, that it would be a voracious appetite, Lord, that we would long for it, that we would prioritize it, and that we would seek hard after it, Jesus. We trust you for that and give ourselves to that purpose. I thank you for the example of your early church in doing the same. Bless it, Lord, we pray for the sake of your gospel, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ and the glory of our great King, we pray this morning. And if you agree with this, let's say amen. And let's stand and sing together.